business don't exist for the purpose of creating shareholder value, in my opinion. Businesses exist to engage the stakeholders and benefit people's lives. Welcome to Vibecast, the podcast that dives deep into the heartbeat of workplace culture. I'm your host, Christy Skutvin. Join me in conversations with extraordinary leaders as we unravel their experiences, both positive and negative, that have impacted workplace culture. This podcast is more than storytelling. It's about actionable insights. Are you ready to transform the vibe at your workplace? Let's go. Today, I chatted with Marshall Lockton, who is the founder of Meraki Investments, which Marshall founded with a goal of acquiring companies with unique customer and employee experiences. Prior to this, Marshall spent 14 years at Lockton as an SVP in the Global Operations Group, and he also remains an active shareholder. Today, he serves as the executive chairman of the Knight Agency. Knight Agency is a marketing agency that builds from the inside out. Knight uses storytelling to connect people and strategy, which drives performance. He is also active in the community, serving on the Big Brother, Big Sister boards while mentoring a little. Listen in to hear more about the impact on vibes Marshall is making. All right, Marshall, well, thank you for joining me and for being open to telling a little bit more about your journey and why creating vibes in the workplace um, are so important to you as you continue your journey in impacting organizations. So I like to have everybody start out telling me a little bit more about how they define a vibe. Um, So if you wouldn't mind sharing what a vibe means to you and how you define it, that would be a great place to start. Yeah, thank you for having me on, Christy. I'm uh, I'm excited about it and uh, honored. Um, a vibe, which I love the name of your show. To me, a vibe is is about how you connect at the workplace. So, connecting to you know the belief in the company, connecting to uh, the behaviors of the rest of your team, and then you know really feeling a connection and a sense of belonging in a workplace, and all that kind of put together uh, means a uh, you know group of people is going to work harder and come together as a team and feel great about what they're doing. And to me, that's what, you know, more than, you know, small things like, um, you know, ping pong tables and beer, which are all great. I think the vibe is really about like the the beliefs, behaviors and belongings and, and sense of connection to the company. Yes, I, I love that sense of connection. I'm I'm right there with you. It's like, how connected do you feel to all the things that a company is? and can be and will be, right? So let's take us back. And I I really want to understand your journey into why workplace vibes have been so important to you or how they became important to you. And so I think it's probably beneficial to start uh, at the beginning or or with Locked In, right? And your journey within Locked In. And then uh, we'll get to where you're at today and what you're doing and how you're impacting organizations. So Tell us a little bit more about kind of your journey and and any defining moments within that journey that really made you decide that like this is important to me and this is important to running a business. Yeah, um, I started my career not thinking I'd go into family business, which is locked in, and we can talk more about that. But I started out my career um, thinking I'd go into marketing, started in marketing and impact related businesses in DC and then went and got an MBA and you know Lockton was growing as my I was fortunate my uncle started um, an insurance brokerage 60 years ago and went out on his own to do things his own way and he was talented at it and I saw the business you know at that time which is 2007 ish you know really kind of going to the next level they had done an international acquisition and it was that time I just said I wanted, you know, I wanted to be part of this, I wanted to see how I could help. And part of what attracted me to it was this uh sense of culture that I, you know, even from the outside I could sense that it had. So I, I joined and um I was the first family member to join as a not a producer, uh, which is in our world is um 
this, a person who focuses on sales and clients. I instead joined as part of our operations group with the idea of learning the business of the business and being part of the group that supported and enabled the organization from the from the center. And um, I got to do that for almost 15 years and company grew four times, but it didn't really ever feel that much different culturally. It just kept consistent sense of culture. But, um, you know, I, I would, like I said, I was fortunate. My uncle started this thing, but I kind of grew up alongside it. It was went from a small business to a nice Casey success story to being a big business. And um, I saw that the core of the success was that they cared a lot about the people that worked there and made it the best place for people to go to to do their trade and their craft and have a great life and career. Okay, so you mentioned something where you could even see from the outside looking in what the culture was or what they were creating at Locked In. So can you explain a little bit more about what you saw and why that was important and how that was differentiated from maybe other businesses that you saw from the outside looking in? Yeah, well, I mean, first you have to know my uh, my uncle and then my dad joined him 10 years later and they, you know, the uncle especially just had a really big exuberant personality and, um, you know, drew people into this thing that he was building that was almost an, you know, kind of extension of his personality. And, you know, my dad being there almost from the beginning, it, it was sort of part of me all growing up. You know, I didn't have a ton of exposure to it before I started working there, but it was always like the interactions, you know, with the people that were part of our, you know, my uh, family's life and my uncle's life. You could just tell they, they they loved working there and, you know, the interactions were positive and, and it was, you know, passionate too. It was like, there wasn't, it's not a um, separate professional from personal. It's kind of like you're all in, you know, integrating the two together. And, and so that's what I saw from the, from the outside and confirmed that that was the case once I got there. Yeah. And that that maybe wasn't a novel concept in 2007, but I think it's become more common practice to have that integration, right? And maybe back in 2007 or even a little bit after that, it was that was less likely to be true in an organization. I would say that was probably um, organizations were more traditional where you don't really integrate the two of those things. So that's pretty cool. It sounds like they were maybe a front runner in some of that. And, you know, my, it was like, if, if you go back and um, listen to my uncle's early talks, you know, people were always at the center of everything, you know, it was all about, hey, our most valuable assets are our people. And, you know, that's really all that we have to sell. And so he'd even say things like, you know, we didn't create the people, their parents create them and they, you know, became themselves on their own that we just provided a place for them to come work and um, we were glad that we found each other. So it was really kind of always back to people at the center of everything that that they did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then you get inside and you start working in operations. Um, were you leading a team at that point or were you an individual contributor? Kind of talk to me about like some of the, like what your role was and then some of the practices that you assumed as you started leading and scaling the organization. Because I think that's really important also to note is that it was, I wouldn't say small, but smaller, but you guys scaled to be quite large. So how did you maintain the culture as you started to scale the organization? Yeah, that, you know, I don't want to give myself too much credit here, but also I'll just kind of talk about my observations. So, you know, my role in the operations group, that was the group that, you know, the CEO, COO, um, CFO, kind of leadership team of the company, but it's a very decentralized company. And so, you know, all the regions and series have their own um, sort of sense of identity and, and groups of leaders as well. But we, you know, we're the group that supported them and, you know, provided strategic direction and shared services. I, I played a bunch of different roles within it in the 14 years. So kind of at the beginning, you know, I came in and I was kind of the young guy on the totem pole. First time they had a, you know, more junior person in the role. So did a bunch of things, but the thing that I loved and kind of think had the biggest long-term impact was uh, we launched a, the first pro producer leadership program. So idea for that was we 
went and interviewed all of our best producers, found out their best practices, wrote down what those practices were. But then, you know, more importantly, put together groups of 12 people from across the country that didn't know each other, that were in a similar spot in their lives and careers and had them spend a year kind of working together to develop themselves and take the next level in their career. So we did that in different iterations of that. And then I started managing some of the shared services groups around people. So like HR, associate development at the time were separate. Um, We brought those together and launched something similar to what we did with the producers. We did with non-sales people with associates. And, you know, how do you go into a leadership position for the first time when, you know, you've built your career by being a great client practitioner? How do you take that at best practices of leading? And so we built those programs. And then I decided I wanted to work on more kind of revenue generating new businesses. And that's how I spent the sort of last half of the 14 years was working on a few complimentary businesses, launching a digital insurance brokerage with a partner and, you know, helping the reinsurance group get brought into the company, working with the shareholders on what kind of investments we wanted to make. A couple that didn't, you know, didn't go well and had to shut down, which was, you know, less fun. So really kind of working with the, you know, how do we grow complementary lines of business and try to get them into the same culture and same success that the rest of the organization had seen. So when you talk about leadership development within the organization, like these, because I think a common a common thing that I see is just because you can do the job doesn't mean you can lead the function, right? And so what what, what became important to you in developing this um, for the producers and for the associates? Like, was there any common thread that you taught within that or to help people understand what's important in leadership or to help people self-select out to say, I don't think this is for me? Because I, I think that's, a challenge in many businesses, right, is people who perform become leaders and then that's not no longer their strong suit. Yeah, no, I think it's especially true in like professional services businesses, you know, like locked in. Our main thing is how do we service clients? And, it, you know, it can be a pretty technical, you know, be expert in things. And so that doesn't necessarily mean you've had a lot of experience leading people. Um, and so that's what we tried to build the programs around. It's like, hey, let's just listen to how other people have done it and let's identify what the best practices are and then give you practice and group to share those with. Is there one thing that we tried to give the people in those programs? I mean, I think it was really more about the accountability to develop themselves. I don't know if there was one thing, but it's like building a plan for themselves and, you know, then having the group that they were put into help hold them accountable to that self-development. Yeah, there's lots of like tactical things I think about people versus being a technical expert or a, you know, client expert. But I think it's really more about the self-development and the, you know, the growth mentality. Yeah, definitely. And did you have people that were like, uh, this isn't for me. I want to go back to doing my thing as a producer or as an associate in whatever whatever area that they were working at before? I think there's people that, yeah, just love doing client work and don't really want to deal with the challenges of managing people. And that's okay. You know, you can be a leader in different ways. You don't have to be a people leader. I think, you know, the people leaders are the ones that are willing to coach and develop and not necessarily do the work themselves, which sometimes you get validated and rewarded for doing the work and your job becomes like, how do I actually put other people in position to succeed? And so, you know, I don't know if I can name a specific place where someone's held their hand and said, this isn't for me, but I'm, I'm sure there are lots of people that prefer to just put their head down, do the work and let the results speak for themselves. Sure. So as you acquired new businesses, scaled, maybe divested businesses that weren't as successful as maybe you guys wanted them to be or thought that they could be or, right, there's successes and failures along the way that help you learn and grow. How did you ensure that you took the culture that your uncle had started, that your dad continued and that you continued 
within those outside parties coming in. Yeah. And there's lots of other leaders, you know, my cousin Ron is the chair today. We had multiple non-family CEOs, great leadership team. And, but I think in our organization, Lockton's organization, it's really a lot about alignment, economic, cultural, and philosophical alignment with the leaders of the businesses that we get into. So they, they would always, you know, kind of start with the leader of a new geography and, and start there and, that's kind of the number one thing around keeping culture is like if you if you choose the right leader to start with, the culture will continue along the same path under that person. Uh, so that's that's kind of number one. I think number two is you know we have a set of philosophies and behaviors that you know are expected in the organization and they're pretty well communicated and widely understood. And so I think our original. COO Mike Frost would say that, you know, people would come into the organization and actually he'd see them get better because of being part of this uh, culture, you know, just because of the, you know, the systems and experiences from those around them. So I think it was this combination of investing, you know, people that are the type of people that we can see fitting in and thriving and then, you know, having the shared belief systems across the organization. I guess the other, the last part is it's a lot of empowerment. You know, people, people in Lockton feel empowered to, to do their best. And that works pretty well because we have these smaller organizations within the organization. So we have what we call units. You know, first we have the bigger like P&Ls and, and series and geographies. But under that, we have these units, you know, which are more, no more than 15 people or less. And so there's a little bit of a smaller culture an empowered culture within that group. So I think it's like, how do you stay small while getting big? You, you know, how do you also eliminate some of the bureaucracy that inflects too many organizations? Yeah, for sure. And it's, I, I had a recent conversation um, with one of my clients a couple weeks ago, and it was exactly this, where it was a leader saying, what's the organization going to do to engage my people? And my response to them was, you as a leader, what are you going to do to engage your people? Because if I look to you and say, what's going to engage your people versus what's going to engage another group or another unit, if you will, right, to use your same term over here, that might be two very different things. And so one person might, one group might be upset that we're doing, you know, some sort of food truck and the other group, they might be stoked on that because that's our favorite thing to do on the weekends, right? So I like what you're saying about like letting these kind of subunits do what's going to be and empowering them, the leaders, to do what's going to be best for those people that report to them or that are peers within them because it might be totally different things. And by engaging one, you might disengage another. Yeah. And I don't think leaders, I mean, it's not possible for, you know, leaders of tens, thousands of people, hundreds of people, whatever, to know everybody's, you know, style. And so, you know, bringing them down into smaller groups and then to your point, adapting it. The trick is, and I, what we're facing today, I would say as an outsider a little bit now, is how do you do both? How do you make sure that, you know, people have an identity within their group and individual self, but then also have this shared identity as, you know, part of a company and that there's certain things that we're doing together as part of a company that's going to make us successful. And so that's, that's a challenge, like doing both, individualizing while also being part of something, you know, bigger than yourself. For sure. And the thing I hear as an obstacle in the way is time, right? So as like the world speeds up or, you know, uh, busy to me is a four-letter word I try not to use because I think we rise to the occasion of the words that we use. But time is what gets in the way of leaders wanting to or having the ability to invest and prioritize their people to understand their individual currency and the group's currency, right? It was like, what's going to motivate, excite, you know, get them to develop to the place that they want to. It's, it, it can um, sometimes seem like a daunting task to some. Yeah, but I go back to your question about vibes. And I think, you know, I said connection. And I think it's, it is about 
workplaces that will truly want to build connection between each other, you know, rather than being there because you're supposed to be at work. Like I'm here because I want to connect with the people that I'm doing this with. And, you know, I, we're all busy. We have personal lives that are as important and but we want to put the most into it while we're at work and we're connecting with the people that we're with. Yeah, yeah. How have you seen, ha, have you been a, a part of or had conversations with anyone who's been a part of an organization where the connection just wasn't happening? And like, I'm sure you have friends or, um, you know, others who are just like this organization. It was just such a bummer because we didn't connect and this was the impact or you know, have you had those experiences? I've been fortunate to mainly work for small companies, but for a couple of years after business school, I worked for a bigger part of a bigger firm that does professional services where I was doing some consulting. And it was very different than at least how I hope people are experiencing Lockton in the sense that they were, yeah, there was no tension to the individual. It was kind of like nameless, faceless, you know, come into the office, you know, you might be sitting people that that you don't know because they're not part of your group and, you know, put a number in if you ever have a IT problem. And it sort of felt like the organization was existing before the people rather than the other way around. It's like, we're, we're here to like, make sure we follow the rules of the organization and fit into, you know, this big thing versus actually we're, we're what's making up this organization. I think that's what it is. It's like um, the company doesn't come first. The clients don't even come first. I think the people that decide to work there have to come first because then all the results will follow from that. How have you as a business leader been able to convince others of this? Because what I run into sometimes when talking about workplace vibes is that there are leaders who want to quantify an ROI for taking a certain action, especially organizations that are publicly held and responsible to shareholders, et cetera, or maybe very finance driven. How have you seen that conversation and what, what's been successful for you in helping others understand the importance of this in creating vibes within an organization? Well, it's the, probably a good time to transition to, um, you know, when I, I decided to leave Lockton to do something on my own, I was fortunate to get to stay with the company as a shareholder and do work with the family, which is great. It would have been hard to, you know, completely leave in, but I decided to do my own thing. And so I, I started to go back on some stuff I was doing with the CEO at the time of Lockton around culture and scaling culture. And it was really about everything kind of coming back to purpose and values. You know, no matter what book you read, it seemed like everything kind of came back to purpose and values. And how do you get people to connect to that? And so I started getting into that. I decided to, that I, what I wanted to do was go work with other businesses and make investments in businesses. But I wanted to look at businesses that thought the same way, like businesses that really, like you said, vibe was at the, part of it, that they believe that, you know, if the people are happy, the client's going to be happy. And our belief was because we were, you know, more or less a family office that we could take a longer term view and invest in quality and people instead of just the bottom line. And so it was more about this like long-term view, you know, take a 25 year view, not a five year view, because if you don't invest properly in the front end, you're not going to get the results over time. And so that's why we started Meraki Investments to go, you know, invest in those kind of companies, make that central to the search. And um, that led me to, you know, a company that I am now a partner of, a majority owner of called Knight. And what we do is this work of trying to convince businesses that there is a true ROI in performance that out of investing and in culture. Can't say I have the answer yet, but uh, maybe I'll pause there and give me a second to think about like, what are some that we do take, you know, make the business case for culture? Yeah, because what I hear, you know, so often is, well, why would I invest dollars to do X, 
right? And I'm not saying that it always takes lots of dollars to improve a vibe. I do think it starts with the leader and leadership and how people lead teams and how they're pouring in and connecting to their teams is hugely important. I was on a a leadership call earlier today, actually, where I think those on the call just appreciated the time and space to be authentically themselves and know that how they're showing up is impacting others and they can show up as themselves because that's probably what people are craving from them. So if they put themselves in this box of, I have to walk through the door of my office and be somebody else because I I have expectations of myself that I need to show up as this other person versus who I truly am. They, they were just like appreciative of that time and space, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it didn't take any money per se, other than just an investment of an hour and a half. But it, it's really hard to tell somebody of like, hey, let's do X, Y, and Z, because it's hard to say that it's going to become A, B, and C, right? And so often we're looking for results of what the time investment is going to get us. Um, And I think it's a long-term game. But yeah, I would really be curious of like how you encapsulate that. I mean, I think one answer, there's obviously people challenges. One of the reasons I like night was that there's businesses that are going to have a shortage of employees, you know, for the foreseeable future, there's going to be retention challenges. There's going to be recruiting challenges. So like most businesses, people are an important component of the business. So yeah, there's a, there's a connection obviously between results and doing things that engage employees. Now, having said that, I'll take a little contrarian view and like, I don't even, I have a hard time totally engaging in the conversation when you just don't get it at all, because it's so like part of my worldview that we don't, businesses don't exist in, businesses don't exist for the purpose of creating shareholder value, in my opinion. Businesses exist to engage the stakeholders and benefit people's lives. And so... You know, saying like, well, I'd rather not do something because it may not have a direct bottom line impact sort of negates the point of, you know, why we're in business to me. So I have a little hard time. I think some of it is finding leaders that do think the same way. I think that that's going to be the most successful engagement is finding leaders that believe that purpose-driven, values-driven companies is not only the right thing to do, but ends up resulting in the most successful outcomes, which I think there's lots of those people out there. And I think it's just finding the ones that maybe need the tools to make it easier to do and, you know, make it not feel like such a unknown or unquantifiable thing. It's like, just give me the roadmap. I I, I agree with you. I just need the the support and roadmap. I am of the same opinion. Like I'm not, I'm not here to change your belief system. So if this isn't your belief system, you you probably should just maybe keep running down the road that you're running down until you hit a wall where you change your belief system that people are important to you and that there is value in investing in the people um, within your organization because uh, until that belief changes, the behaviors around it won't change, right? Um, so I, I agree with you. It's probably more of like a gut check as you're engaging with folks to say, huh, are you, is this part of your DNA of like how you're wired and what you want for your organization or not? Yeah. I think there's different levels of it, right? I mean, I think there's some people like you and I that probably spend a lot of time talking about these issues and, you know, really kind of feeling them as important to our lives. And then there's others that, you know, leading a business is hard. There's lots of different challenges or, you know, you got to make the financials numbers work. You've got to deal with you know, compliance issues and yeah, strategy issues. And so people feels like one component versus um, kind of fueling all the components. And so how do you get people to, you know, make the linkage more quickly? It's not that they don't believe it. It's like, just show me how I can, how it fits into my overall, you know, priorities. Yeah. Is there any story that you have, Marshall, about kind of changing the way some, like maybe somebody who reported to you or a leader that you worked with, how you 
influence them to come around to see that this is in fact important and and maybe what the impact had once they change their mindset around it? I think that um, one tool for that is like, you know, speaking other people's language, not necessarily speaking your own. So like if you're, I think my worldview is probably pretty purpose-based, motivated by impact. I think that if I'm talking to somebody who you know, thinks those things are great, but it's pretty, you know, analytical and strategic, then then I probably want to put it in their terms. And so I think an example was, you know, we were working on some community impact work with um, the family and, you know, being able to figure out how other people viewed the impact of doing that work and the benefit to the company and how we could recognize associates versus just the pure act of, you know, doing it, which is great, but, you know, being able to reframe it in other people's language, I think is helpful. And, you know, with, like I said, within the overall priorities that they are thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So like meeting them where they're at versus expecting them to come to you with the same mindset that you have. I think that's right. Yeah. You know, persuasion doesn't work very well. Like you, you kind of have to, you can only meet people as far as they're willing to go. It's really hard to change people's minds. Yeah. And they have their opinion for a reason too. I always try to reframe that in my mind, right? Is like they're coming from a place based on their own experiences that put them in the mindset that they're in because of the belief that they have. It doesn't make it wrong. It just is different. Yeah. It's like, let's understand their point of view. It's uh, one of Covey's habits, seeking to understand and then be understood, right? Kind of the same the same idea. And I use that a lot in the work that I do. I'm sure you do too. It's kind of hard to like, you know, remember to step out of your own perspective. But uh, yeah, just spend a little bit of time thinking about like, why did they come to this opinion and realizing it's valid too. And even though earlier I said like, for me, stakeholders are most important and shareholders is just one element. Like there's plenty of valid reasons to think that if you don't have profits, nothing else is going to matter. And so trying to um, keep that perspective. Yeah. What comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? (laughs) Okay. I have to ask you, I can only see a piece of the quote that's on your back wall or the picture that's on your back wall, but it's just uh, something about investing in people. So I wanted to, okay, to invest in people so we all have the opportunity to thrive. I love that. Did that, is that yours or is that, did that come from somewhere? So, yeah, that's, I mean, the story I did sort of told, but when I left Locked and I was working with this coach, um, Chet Scott, who we've worked with for a long time. And, you know, it was kind of a hard, it was kind of a harder time period for me. It was kind of in that, you know, COVID time period, things weren't going as well as I wanted at work. And so I kind of worked harder with him than I had in the past to really get clear on purpose. And so that, plus another program I did called Stegen, both were based on purpose. And so that to invest in people so we all have the opportunity to thrive is my purpose. And from that kind of came the Rocky Investments as an expression of that is, you know, investing in businesses that are serving clients, communities, and associates by creating purpose and profit, resulting in a more meaningful life for all. And so you know, that was just, again, having a purpose orientation and a knowing yourself better. It's so much better for trying to find your own path. And that would, that's what I ended up deciding to do. And so that purpose statement became meaningful to me and it needs a better place on my wall. But it's kind of what I think about as I'm making my next decisions about what to do with, you know, business and life. Yeah, that's awesome. So it sounds like it was an iterative process. I too have a purpose statement, but I love that you put it, you kind of memorialized it and and you're going to put it on your wall because I think that's so important for everybody to have. I just worked with a group of leaders at a school actually to help them as the school year was kicking off, create that purpose for themselves and walk through the exercise of creating a purpose statement so that they could kick off the year understanding who they are and what gifts they have to give to others so that they they could in fact do that, right? So that the year had meaning versus walking into it thinking it was the same year as last year and without the intention behind what their purpose is and 
what they have to give to the world. So that's really cool. I like that idea. I'm going to do that. You know, I think that the purpose is, you know, we we all we all get to live on this earth once. And, you know, so figuring out like where your gifts meet your interests and, you know, what you're good at, meet your um, abilities to contribute something. And there's a need in the world. That's That's sort of what purpose is. And it works for people, I think, and it also works for companies. And so it's, you know, I'm kind of treading old ground here, but I think it's, it doesn't necessarily give you like the map, but it gives you a North Star and then you can work your way towards it over time. Yeah, definitely. It, it can help you say yes and no to things. That's what I always think, right? Like, is is this in line with what my purpose is and where I want to drive my time? You're starting them early. You're starting the students early too. And like thinking about it early, it took me till I was in my 40s to to really get it down. And so I think like as you get into college and, you know, go into your first jobs, I mean, that could really make a difference for people. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I was sharing um, my daughter started high school today and um, the school that she's going to is very purposeful. I would say it's a small high school. And part of their mission and purpose is to help kids think and live well. And I just like, I keep telling my daughter, like, live that, like, understand that and lean into that because that is, that is so cool that you have the opportunity to be surrounded by an organization that believes in that um, at such a young age, because we, you don't always get that opportunity. So yeah, they they truly lean into that statement as their purpose in everything that they do. So it shows up in many different ways. And I think organizations all over, it doesn't have to be a school, but can do the same thing. It's just like showing up and taking action that's aligned with the purpose that they set out to, to have. You know, it's a great statement. Think well and live well lucky my kids are at a similar place. And I guess it does mean that there are more and more organizations that are trying to be led by purpose and, you know, communicating it. So, I mean, that's a positive, it's definitely a positive development for uh, uh, more people finding something that lights them up and makes them feel passionate. And I'm glad that they're getting that exposure at a younger age now. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm with you. It took me into my forties and I was like, oh, okay, now, okay. I understand why this is important and what I need to do. And like, I need to drop that cause that is not serving me well. And I need to do more of this because that is right. So, okay. So if you had one piece of advice that you could give listeners and leaders about what they can go do next. So something simple, and it doesn't have to be all encompassing of leadership, but just to take the next step in the right direction to start maybe living or leading with more purpose, what would that be? The coach I referenced, Chet, convinced me that you know, to be a good leader, it's all about being authentic to yourself. And so to, to be authentic to yourself, you have to know yourself better. And so how he does that and how we did that was writing a lot, you know, writing until you feel like you've got it down. And now, like I read it most mornings, even though it's probably totally repetitive by now, I keep reading it. So it, it gets ingrained in you. And for him and his coaching, it's, you know, worldview, identity, passions, principles, process. And then your opus is your overarching vision, purpose, and how you're going to accomplish that. And so... Not, I recognize that everybody has the benefit of, you know, hiring a personal coach to work them through that. But to the extent you can, you know, journal, spend the time to like write things out, both about your purpose and who you are, but also just about your, like your, your business and just take time to slow down and reflect. And you're not, you're going to have a hard time communicating with any kind of passion if you don't have some belief system and it's pretty internalized. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So just start writing it down, open a piece of paper, take a pen and just start to go. Right. I'm sure that you'll look back. You probably look back now at some of the things that you journaled early on and you're like, what the heck was I thinking? Or like, wow, I was pretty insightful. <laughs> yeah, and there's been different times where it was more, uh, there's probably more 
came out than others. And, you know, right now it's probably a little more tweaking because, you know, I feel like I'm on a good path, but other times it's like, hey, we got to do a complete rework of, you know, what the vision is. And, and so I think at least for me, writing is a, uh, is a, is a better tool than just thinking and ruminating. And so I try to find time to write. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Marshall. Is there any parting words that you would like to share? Anything that um, we haven't chatted about yet that you feel is important to share with listeners? No, you know, I think the only thing we didn't get to that I would that I would encourage everyone to think about is, you know, how do we how do we create more of these opportunities for people to express themselves as human beings? You know, what both me as a professional and and me as a person and they don't have to be separate. So how do we create more space for in companies for people to be able to express themselves as, as individuals and see each other for who they are, you know, kind of get past identities around that we, that we have in today's world and, and get into like, Hey, we have a lot in common. You know, this is who this person really is authentically. And, uh, Companies can be one of the great places that those kind of connection points can happen. And is there anything that you've done in particular that has helped at Night Agency or within, you know, your experience that has helped people make that connection or created that impact for people to connect or those opportunities for people to connect more? You know, for Night, we're building what we call the the People Stories platform, which means how do we use the voice of the employees to tell the story of the company? And don't just ask them, like, why do you like working here? Ask them who they are as people, you know, what motivates them? How do they connect to the company's purpose? You know, what's gone well in their life? What's been a challenge in their life? And it's amazing what you can get out in 45 minutes. And then and then that becomes a tool for, um, you know, companies to use in all different forms. And it also becomes a way that the people connect to the purpose and connect to the company. So, you know, that's a little bit of an advertisement, but it's a, an example of like using people, using people where they are authentic human beings and and really trying to understand them. Yeah, I, that's great. It's asking like different questions. So I was on a, a leadership call this morning and I had a question for the group or each individual. And it was, if you were to write a book, what would it be about? And people just came to life. It was pretty incredible. At first, there was a little hesitation, like, oh, I'll just tell something really surfacey. And then as I started kind of digging in, there was a lot to uncover about who these individuals were. And it was really, really, really cool. Yeah. It's just getting past that like first set of questions and then having them trust you. And but like a other question is um what describes you and what defines you and you know, how do, how do people think about that question or just creating a space for people to have their own stories be told? So awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and the impact that you're making out in the world and on organizations. Um, I think it's so cool what you're up to and we definitely need more of it. So appreciate you, your time, your energy and um, yeah, looking forward to just continue to follow and see how you're impacting organizations and people. Well, I know you're doing the same and we're on, you know, similar paths with companies and people. So I look forward to keeping in touch and uh, thanks for having me on. During my conversation with Marshall, it was so great to hear his journey within Lockton, a family owned insurance brokerage and how the company's culture played a significant role in its success. Marshall emphasized the importance of connection, beliefs, behaviors, and a sense of belonging in creating a strong workplace vibe. I loved how he also talked about the challenges of maintaining culture while scaling an organization and the need for individualization within a shared identity. It was awesome to hear Marshall emphasize the need for leaders to believe in the value of investing in people and creating purpose-driven companies. One thing that keeps Marshall centered around creating the right vibe is by journaling and reflecting, neither of which cost anything to do. Try it out and see what happens. I bet you'll surprise yourself. 
In fact, if you want to push yourself a bit more, try our 75 Vibes Challenge. 75 days of five simple and quick practices that will build beliefs and behaviors to improve your vibes. The link to get started can be found in the show notes. Let's go. If this episode inspired you and you want to see how you can take the next step to creating a better vibe within your organization, I'd love for you to download our complimentary 75 Vibes worksheet. This is a simple tool to create a habit and mindset around creating great vibes in work and life. The best part, it's simple and it works.